So I just like to go back in after the meeting and kind of make some adjustments. Like it does, you have to let it sit for like a couple of hours, but then you go back and you just make adjustments to like the title and the, everything like that, and it should be fine. So is this, this will now be live then? Yeah, we'll be yes. there. But remember, there. like, there you go. It'll, um, sorry. We've got a notification saying that it's being streamed live. It's a 20 second delay, Nick. Yeah, okay. So it's now live, yeah? Should be. Okay, cool. Are you Excellent. looking at YouTube? Yeah. Sweet. Okay, thanks, Erica. All right, that should be good. All right. Okay. So call me if you get into any more trouble, then we'll fix it, okay? Okay, cool. Excellent. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> no problem. Bye. Hello. Sorry. Could you hear me through all of that? Apologies. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so sorry about that. A slightly panicked voice has really set our confidence. <laughs> so we are we are now live. I, I, I muted my, my video. My audio. So we are now live on on YouTube or on a slightly different um, link to what we were on before because of issues with Zoom. But uh, we are now live on YouTube. So I will hand over uh, if if Sam, you want to take control of the meeting and get your presentation up. Uh, yeah. Happy to happy to hand over. Hey, just give me a second. It's two o'clock, would you just start, aren't we? Yeah, two o'clock, yeah. Is the link still the same for everybody else? I'm going to share that link in there because the current one isn't, isn't working. Um, okay. so. oh. Could I ask you to share that link to my team leader who will share it through our social media as well? You've got a pen habit handy. His email is mcnab.lorry at dumbgal.gov.uk and he will share that out through Galloway Glen's social media as soon as how, how, sorry how do you spell sorry I need to put that down again I'm just trying to do a, a few different things <laughs> sorry no, I've simply have been there uh, McNab M-C-N-A-B-B yeah dot lorry L-A-U-R-I-E yeah at dumbgal D-U-M-G-A-L dot gov dot uk okay i'll sell that so nick can you share the new link and i'll email the people that have signed up on yeah, event rights I'll, I'll email it out to them there you go there's that new link thank you <laughs> Um, I've emailed everybody that signed up that link, but it might take a minute for it to come through to their inboxes. Because it's yeah. on YouTube, they'll have the option of starting it from the beginning, which means they'll get all of this oh, stuff okay. as well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, do we have many 
Anybody signed up, Rebecca? Say that again, sir. We have quite a few people signed up. Just I'm happy to wait, you know, five minutes or whatever you, whatever you advise. I can't hear you very well. Do you know? It's a bit echoey. Um, I want microphone. Uh, your microphone's being very, very cr uh, Chris, uh, 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 crackly, Sam. You might be better off just using the laptop's microphone. Yeah, done that. How's it now? Better. Better? Good. Okay. Well, yes. um, just if we had a lot of people signed up, you know, we can wait five minutes or whatever you want to do, just let me know. There's 19 people signed up to it, and then the oh. link was put out on Twitter just for people to pop in to the YouTube link rather than sign up yeah. um, this morning. So hopefully there'll be a few more um, come through there. To be honest, if it's gone two o'clock, uh, we may as well just get cracking. Uh, because most people who watch this will be able to, um, I say, fast forward away from the beginning bits like this and uh, go straight to the beginning presentations. As long as it's recording on YouTube, you're now in safe hands of YouTube. Cross your fingers. Your, your choice, Rebecca, Nick, from Mars PV. That sounds fine to me. Is that okay, Nick? Shall we just? Yeah, I'm. I'm happy. I mean, it's your. It's uh, it's your presentation, so I'm happy to happy to do whatever. As I said, it will be recorded on 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 YouTube in perpetuity. So, um, so yeah, please feel Great. free to take it away. Okay. Our presentation on our project three landscape restoration project. So. What we're going to do today is I'm going to get a little bit about the background of this project and we're going to have a, a site tour from our reporter in the field, Nick Chisholm uh, and David Thompson, because we really think this project comes alive when you can see it in situ. So let me just set the scene. We have a landscape which is ecologically exhausted. It is a landscape that through intensive agriculture has lost much of what it once had. It's an area where we have habitats with latent potential, habitats waiting to come back out into the fore. And the whole ethos of this project is about how we create new natural heritage, how we work with natural processes to try and get to a better level of biodiversity and biomass and bioactivity on this site. And we're going to do that by changing the way we look at a piece of land like this. So instead of looking at it as a farm divided into fields, compartments of woodland, we're going to look at it instead as zones of habitat. So part of this project is changing that concept of looking at small areas of, of enclosure to larger areas of, of habitat that work together as an ecosystem between wetland, woodland and grassland habitats. And of course, at Threve, we're inspired by our very successful osprey breeding program, which we've had for about 15 years. And this has taught us a really important lesson, and I think one that many in the conservation sector are inspired by. And that's that nature has an amazing ability to regenerate. When we started the osprey breeding program, all we did was put up a nest and safeguard that nest through a volunteer observation program. From that, we have had success after success, years of chicks being raised and fledged. And now the population of ospreys, as it is across Scotland, has increased hugely. So taking that inspiration, I wanted to focus a little bit on the actual site of where we're doing our project to try and capture that spirit at a much larger scale. So we're in Castle Douglas, which is in southwest Scotland, in the Friesen Galloway, and our site is just to the west. It's highlighted in green. So at 81 acres, uh, hectares. It's surrounded by really important scientific designated sites. Ramsar wetlands, SPAs for migratory geese, triple SIs. So what we're doing is adding in the keystone, the missing link in the chain, to create a much more robust and stronger uh, landscape habitat. So the project's 
important for what I said. It's a really important positive message in a time where we get a lot of depressing news about what we can do about the environmental crisis. It's also exciting because this is our 100 year plan, our 100 year experiment to look at ways that we can support regeneration of natural processes and restore landscapes. For us, it's quite exciting for the National Trust for Scotland because we're looking at it as one of a very, very few lowland project in Scotland doing this type of activity. So we're quite excited by kind of trailblazing and what we hope to, to inspire other landowners and farmers with the impacts that we're doing and how they may change their approach to land management. And of course, as Scotland's national conservation charity for the National Trust for Scotland, it's so important that what we're doing is publicly accessible. And a lot of what I'll be talking about during this presentation ties in to really important elements some other projects don't always have. And that is that we want to take the public with us. We want this to be a sort of education and inspiration and very much focused on how the next generation and the wider public approach nature conservation projects. So how do we make this happen? How do we get from this ecologically exhausted landscape to one that's buzzing and uh, um, full of life? Well, we've decided to break it down into a series of work packages, work streams, each targeting different elements of what we're trying to do. So we're looking at woodlands and how we develop different ways to approach regeneration or plantation of woodlands, experimenting between different types of woodland creation, creating in due course uh, a 27 hectare uh, native woodland. We're gonna be looking at how grazing can have a really positive influence on our activities. This land is still gonna be productive in that we're still going to have um, cattle, but instead of cattle being intensively farmed, we're looking at new ways to support cattle and their uh, grassland meadows. And we're looking at new technology to do that. Of course, we're at a site full of human history as well. Um, just uh, the other year, there was a great story about us finding a 10,000 year old burnt hazelnut, which is, a, um, I'm told by the archeologists, a sign of human habitation dating all the way back then. And as some of you will know, um, as some pictures as well will show you later, Threve Castle at the center of our site is an iconic image of early medieval Scotland and one that I think uh, many people will, will be familiar with. So we want to take that relationship, that human relationship between um, the, how the landscape's been influenced and changed and how we will hopefully change it for the better into the future. We're also doing very particular projects, looking at a former stream that's become basically a field drain and how we help naturalize that waterway. The, the water and the flow of water on our site is hugely important. And one of the flagship activities that we're doing is what we're calling dam busters. You're, you're seeing they all have quite fun names, these projects, but dam busters is all about how we restore the flow into a wetland area. And of course, we want to reflect on the visitors and how they engage with the site and putting in the appropriate boardwalks and infrastructure will allow them to do that. And also more research on key species such as the migratory geese. Now, I've got with me um, this afternoon, um, Nick Chisholm from the Gallery Glens Landscape Partnership Scheme, who has been um, a project partner and represents our key funder for the National Trust for Scotland in delivering this project. Nick. Are you hearing me okay? Are you are you on site? Yes, yep. I'm on site. I'm on Littlewood Hill, which I think if you appear with an arrow on your map, the rest of the people will be able to find out where I am. There we are. Great. I'm going to stop sharing and um, let's get your report from uh, Littlewood Hill. Thank you. I don't know if people can see me there or clearly. I just, just, the screen appears to have gone black. Um, I'll just, therefore, we can see you. Perfect. Right, um, yeah, I'm on Littlewood Hill, which is in the sort of northern end of the, the catchment. Incredibly different already. Um, but this is where actually we're standing here at the moment. The Galloway Glens Landscape Partnership helped National Trust do uh, a little archaeological dig on here. So we're actually on a, a former habitation as well, uh, an Iron Age uh, <laughs> Bronze Age habitation. Um, the boundaries of the project you can clearly see from up here. Um, in the distance there, and I'm going to try and zoom in, I don't know how effective that will be. Um, uh, you can see the Carlingwalk Lane and a wetland flash. 
that's the one edge of the project, and that's a man-made structure which comes out of uh, uh, Carlingwood Lock in Castle Douglas. We've got River D, which you can just about see in the distance there, at the, uh, surfing around a lot of the sites. And there in the distance there, you should be able to see, hopefully, Threeth Castle. Now, the first place I'm going to go down to is going to be where we're going to be doing the Dam Busters project. I'll be a lot closer to everything down there. The Dam Busters, as, as Sam has said, is a really key element of this because it's a statement of intent. We're going to allow nature to take over this area while still allowing some form of production from, from cattle and potentially sheep in the past. And the really important critical element of this is just dismantling the anthropological effects as much as possible and allowing the landscape to thrive in whatever conditions it's faced with in the future. We all know that there's going to be intense climate chaos in the future. In fact, the reports out yesterday indicate that's far worse than we first expected. So we want this landscape to be able to adapt to that, to adapt with natural process to what's going on. So I'm going to hand back to Sam in the studio and turn my, um, my video off and we'll go down to the river and I'll see you all again in a minute. Thanks, Nick. That's great. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what we're going to see in a, in a moment. So what we we need to focus on, you've seen the kind of majestic Galloway D flowing through. We wanted to understand exactly the flow of, um, of this important waterway that we're, we're dealing with. We commissioned through various companies that we've been working with, great partners like Conix uh, and Seebeck, who did our hydro hydrological studies, to understand exactly from a scientific point of view what the river does at different times of flood. It was really important for us to have this information so we could speak confidently to the public and to organizations such as Nature Scott that what we were looking to do would not have any detrimental impacts on the wider, uh, wider area. And I'm really pleased to say that we've got a wonderful study and working with CBEC has really provided us with that data. And uh, we've used it already in several presentations and it's really informed some of the infrastructure that we're looking at, such as the boardwalks to get the heights right, but also on the type of what um, Nick was talking about just there, about building in a sense that Scotland's climate is changing. Self-adaptation, change, is something that is gonna be a hallmark of, of this project. Now, when Nick's ready, um, I wonder if Nick, can tell us a little bit about the key findings of the report. And if we can get a little bit of a kind of zoom in on the wetland that we're creating, some of the detail there. I can see David Thompson as well, who's our estate manager. Yeah, so uh, I've, been, I've been stamping down to the riverside here. And we're here at the edge here of this wetland. You want to start showing the screen. Mm -hmm. So we're at the edge of this wetland here. At the moment, you can see it's completely disconnected from the river. This has been a situation for several hundred years. In fact, the oldest maps we can find of three have this, this flood embankment, which I'm now stood upon. And there's, sorry about breath, I was running a little bit there. And this is the River D here. Now, this probably would have been the natural break, it would have come through ordinarily, but we're gonna break through about 20 meters of this section of the flood bank. We're gonna be putting in infrastructure to ensure there's still good access around the site, etc. But we'll be allowing River D to from now on to flow through um, this wetland, which I'll now go and show you. Approximately on what's called a one in uh, a 10 percentile flood condition. So that, that's kind of the flow in which the river will flow at uh, only 10% of the time. So a lot of the time it will remain dry. We're hoping that the, the very low diversity which we have at the moment will therefore increase with greater um, flow input and create this wonderful wetland habitat for people to see and for biodiversity. We'll be creating scrapes through it. Um, and, uh, and people will be able to walk through this sort of, sort of like my teas and, and other vegetation. So we're going to go from here um, over to another area which is perhaps resonant for the, the whole three area. And that's where we're going to be looking at some goose populations um, uh, through the goose project and some uh, wetland stuff over there. I'm a little bit out of breath, Sam. I ran too fast. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I'll let you catch, uh, catch your breath. And I hope that um, 
four by four can yeah, be a little bit easier for you to get over to the next uh, location. So it just will be, I think. <laughs> good. I'm just going to talk a little bit about. Um, I thought well, I want to show something to everyone um, on the the kind of the aerial view of what we were just looking at um, with uh, with Nick there. So Nick um, was right down by the river. So this is a, a flood event. This happened earlier this year. And this just gives you the sense that he was on that hill. This is the inundation uh, in the wetland area that we're hoping to, to, to stabilize, to make it wetter for longer for more parts of the year. And then we're seeing this archipelago of islands, which forms in the, the River Dee. And uh, we're looking over parts of the site now, directly in front of us is, is Port Hill. Coming here, we see that Millburn that I mentioned about restoring that field drain. We see areas of boardwalk. Below us now, there will be wildflower meadows and grazing. And then on the other side of the site, to the east of the site, this very large new native woodland. So it just gives you a little bit of a sense. So Nick is driving through um, this landscape just now as he gets to the next location. Now, of course, for our point of view, the wetlands are hugely important. The National Trust for Scotland was bequeathed Threve Estate by Major Alan Gordon, and he gave it to the organisation, not because of the house, not because of the garden, which now exists, and we've created over the years, but because of the wetlands. He was a war hero uh, who had a very traumatic experience during the, the First World War. He, he was uh, decorated. And a quiet man, a reserved man, but he'd always had great pride in the wetlands on his estate. And it was those wetlands and the migratory geese that was one of the reasons, the reason he gave us the property. In fact, he said that he cared so little for his house, we could blow it up. We didn't. We did some more interesting things with it. But that was part of the thinking then. So it's really nice for us for the first time in 60 years, over 60 years of having three of estate, we're finally with this project being able to 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 honour that really important uh, bequest made those de all those decades ago. Of course, we can't do this project without our partner, Galloway Glen's Landscape Partnership Scheme. And it's been really exciting for us to work with them on a whole range of projects, this being one of the flagships. And I think for an organisation like the National Trust for Scotland, for us, it is about opening our doors and our minds to, to working with different partners, that we can actually have a really leading role in making connections and making what we're supposed to do to a certain extent, and that is long-term resilience and sustainability um, for projects. We are this year 90 years old, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, our ambition with this project is 100 years, so we'll, we'll repeat the length of the organization plus 10 years. Now, partnerships also come in all the people that we're working with. But what we wanted to do was bring in specialists from different fields to make sure that we were getting really insightful opinion, uh, research, and also as we move forward, the creation of a scientific steering group. And this is really important for us because we view this project as a giant science experiment. There are very few organizations that can give such a large area of land, find the resources, financial, in terms of people and expertise, to look at doing a long-term experiment. It's one of the few things, um, well, a few organizations that can do is National Trust for Scotland. So we're really proud of, of what we're able to do with this project. Now, Nick, um, are you approaching your uh, next destination? Uh, I am approaching my next destination. At the moment, uh, uh, David is very kindly opening a gate for me. Uh, the long grass is making driving around a bit slower. What is amazing going through this, uh, I was saying to some people earlier, it's like being in a, a Disney film set. There's butterflies coming up through this long grass um, all over the place. And, I know this is just uh, uh, basically uh, grass fields that he's left uncut at the moment, but it's already an increase in biodiversity. You will notice, however, if you want to stop sharing your screen as you go up out to Not Robin, that the, the landscape has changed, it's more, uh, it, it has been cut here. This is part of a, 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 an end of tenancy arrangement, I, best, I guess you could call it, with the, the, the vacating farmer. However, we're up on a goose pasture now. This is a, a goose roost. Uh, very important for uh, wintering wildfowl in the winter. Uh, Davies beside me can probably give you a rough idea, but I think it's about five or six thousand pink foot geese roost on this on a regular basis. And it's really important that whilst we are, um, you know, talking about naturalizing everything, and, and that is the case, we've got to take combinations so of these important wildfowl populations, which of course are a critical part of the whole three projects. 
hoping with this to say see the WAP Islands, which are part of the of the sort of like the the, the, the river system there as it as it braves around downstream of the castle. And just down from here, we've got a very boring watercourse, and it's really boring because what we've done to it, and this is called the Millburn. You can see the Millburn is that green strip there. I don't know if on the, the screen you can see clearly, but you can see the old track of the watercourse as it meanders through the fields. This is completely straightened uh, for agricultural purposes, but now we're going to allow it to, to rewild, if you like, probably the wrong term, but we're going to be putting structures in it to give flow diversity uh, and create greater biodiversity throughout the whole stream. We've already done the, the electrofishing and vertebrate surveys. It's all been fully habitat surveyed. So we know we're starting from an extremely low baseline of what should be quite large numbers of salmonids on it. And as you can see there in the distance, depending on how big your screen is, is a, ro uh, a rodo running across the field. Uh, and, but the, um, the, the stream as it is at the moment is very, very poor diversity, very silted and very little room for anywhere to spawn or for, nurse, for, for young fish to thrive. And we'd hope in a few years time, after the structure is put in, uh, naturalized, we'll end up with salmon and trout spawning in here again, particularly trout, it's quite a small water course. I'll just run across to the, to the stream because we've got more to get going. And I'm parked a bit further away than I think David intended. So as you can see, the riparian zone is actually not too bad, but the stream itself, as we get down into it, you'll see thirsty. a few old stones and minnows that you see. It's really quite poor uh, quality. So I'll improve dramatically. Now, I think the next place we're going to be going to, Sam, if you want to guide me, is going over to have a look at one of the areas where fences may have been removed. Yes, exactly. I'll let you uh, get into position on, on that. Okay. I think that we've had a bit of a technical hitch and Sam's disappeared from our screens. Well, that's a, that's a great shame. So I'll walk, I'll walk slowly so I don't get out of breath. But um, while Sam's coming back onto screen, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the levelling project. Thanks, um, Nick. I'm not a historian, but uh, many people have heard of the, the, uh, the levellers, some like me know it as a band. But actually in Galloway, there was... Uh, this band of people who, during the Enclosures Act, got very fed up with people close, enclosing pieces of land to turn it into agriculture. Some would argue a lot of these people then left because of all the various Enclosure Acts and left the land. So it would be a, a time of depopulation. And groups of people called levellers came around and they started pushing down up walls and, and trying to disrupt that whole process. And we've called this project the Three Levellers because in effect, we're trying to, you know, bring that process of leveling back on, this time for a good biodiversity reason. You'll see around here, there's still dry stone dikes. There's still fences. We intend to remove all of those fences. All the dry stone dikes will be breached. So they're important habitat in themselves. So they're not gonna be taken away uh, to allow wildlife to just wander through. The hedgerows will be left in place, but to, and they'll be allowed to grow out, etc. But instead of the landscape being constrained by artificial boundaries as we've put on so we can grow different crops in different places, the landscape will be open and allow wildlife to, to just run through it. Now I've lost my lift at the moment, but hopefully we'll get down here and see what's going on. If you can see in the distance there, you can probably just see we have, we've already removed a great deal of the fences and more fences are being removed all the time. I think so far, about two miles of fences have been taken down on the estate. And that's an ongoing process with volunteers getting engaged in doing that. Uh, any sign of Sam? I'm back. <laughs> uh, hello, Sam. <laughs> uh, Sam's actually a historian. So apologies Thank if you. I give you a very poor three levelers account. But Sam may be able to fill in whilst I, die, I find my lift and move over to the area we were talking about. 
I hope so, Nick. I hope so. What, what have you covered so far? Have you just been talking about some of the principles behind the, the levelers? The principles behind the levelers, but maybe you could go into some more detail about who the levelers actually were and why they're so angry. And, uh, and the, an important element of the levelers for Kelton, because Kelton was slightly different in the whole levelling uh, uh, um, episode. Exactly. I think, let me just get to the right point in our presentation and catch up with you. I mean, what's, I mean, you've kind of got a theme as with what we're trying to do and make those connections between uh, human history and, um, and, and natural history. And I think you get these kind of key points in human history where landscape becomes hugely important in how people conduct themselves. So 1724 in, uh, in Bonnie Galloway, where we are, um, tenant farmers, really unhappy about the way the landscape was changing and the way that landowners were treating them. So rents were up, rents were really critical, but also you had the creation of these parks, cattle parks for the, the, the trade in, in beef that was making the Galloway gentry incredibly wealthy. But in order to do this, the whole economic model, the entire societal model of the, of the area had to change. And you had a point of conflict. So everyone was gathering for one of the, the great local fairs at Kelton. And um, there was uh, about a thousand people, all angry, all upset, all looking at losing their livelihoods. And uh, their reaction to this was was a number of, um, of 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 actions, particularly the pushing down of the the dikes, the the, the dry stain walls that were holding the the cattle, these cattle pens. And it was a symbolic action. They would all gather together, and they would be led. It was almost semi-religious, and they would push over these dikes. They also did other things. Um, such as maiming of cattle, but it was to attack the economic interest of the of the gentry landowners. So it was a real kind of conflict point in our local history, and it still traces that some dikes survived from that time, and they were survived for lots of different reasons. But quite an interesting facet of the of the site. So we want to bring that in to some of the methodology of what we're doing with um, with, with the project. So we've got our own three levelers, which I think Nick's been talking about, and that's really changing the aesthetic. For us, one of the big things looking at a site like this, remember I mentioned about changing from being compartmentalized fields to looking at things as habitat zones. Well, from a human point of view, the best way to do that is take away the fences, take away the boundaries and really open the place up. And I think visually it's a great experience, um, but also I think it, it helps us really change that critical relationship in 2021, just um, uh, as the levelers attempted in their own way in 1724. So uh, it's not 1724, but time is pushing on, and I am actually now at one of the leveling sites uh, with the, the daily finally catching up with me as I was running across the field. This is a huge amount of work that the volunteers have been doing. You know, here's a it's a bit of material has been taken out recently. But as you see, these are these are quite biodiverse um, hedgerows, but they're going to get even more diverse as as as, as things move on. And shortly, we'll be going over and having a look at some cattle. But the cattle thing is really quite important because we're going to be trying some innovative grazing techniques to, to allow these uh, these areas to be grazed if required, based upon a good the hedges, etc. In there, we can imagine a landscape where wildlife can just walk through these hedges and not finding anymore a rylock hedge, a rylock fence blocking them. A real key uh, key change, I think, is how we look at an area of landscape like this. So I thought as I've been brought to the, and spoken about levelers for some period, here's a bit where we've done some levelling. And I'm going to be going next to, to look at some cattle. So uh, Sam, if you're going to stay with us this time, I'd love you to talk about cows whilst I go and find them. Great, yes. I'll try not to, uh, to disappear. Um, so it is really important for us to, to find the right type of partners, as I mentioned. And we've been really lucky in finding the right type of partner for our grazing activities. So we're moving now um, over to the kind of open pasture that you'll see in the, the smaller screen. And what we're interested in with our grazing, it's, it's kind of multifaceted. From one point of view, it's about maintaining a really important tradition of the landscape and working with heritage breeds such as the beautiful Belted Galloways and working with a, a young family um, and their grazing enterprise. So it's quite exciting to have that, that partnership. But we're looking at using new technology to help us do this. So we're taking down all the fences. So how do we manage, potentially manage grazing activities on site? 
And what we're looking at is using uh, technology developed by a Norwegian company called NoFence, which is a GPS tracking collar that you can fit onto your livestock. Now, by using this collar, you're able to design the trainings involved, first of all, with your beasts, and then you're able to design your grazing area as required. Um, it, they're trained to obey this because they hear a sound if they go over the, the boundary. If they continue to go over, there's a pulse, much like modern stock fencing anyway, but they react. They are you know, very much uh, trainable animals. They understand um, what they're being asked to do. And the technology will allow us to graze different areas at different times. We're very creative with the areas that we graze. Some areas that we have are sensitive at different times of the year. Other areas we can be uh, more confident with, with grazing. So we can design these, these, um, these GPS um, uh, maps that will fit into, the, uh, into, a, into your phone or, or wherever you're using the platform. It's really easy to do, but it's quite an exciting way to, to be managing cattle from an from a, from a agricultural management point of view. Now the benefit is we're able to then save resources, money, time and stress managing all these these uh, boundaries that we have in, in modern agriculture. So it's quite an exciting change. It could really save a lot of money for organizations and for, for farmers and land managers. The other part of that, of course, is the ecological element. Now we've studied this site down to the microbic level. And it really has been something so important for us to understand the chemical makeup of what we're dealing with. What does it look like under a microscope, intensively farmed agriculture? How will it change year on year? So we're really looking at getting that base uh, of, of data, which we've done with our, um, our partner, uh, Conix. And now we're looking at, and we'll be studying how this type of holistic grazing should keep the right type of um, flow of nutrients and disturbance that will make sure we have the right level of, uh, of flora. So much richer flora across the site. And that was very typical and beautiful wildflower meadows, which we're actually already seeing coming up much sooner than expected. So really exciting and important part of the, of the project. And, and remember we've got that wetland, grassland, woodland combination, that critical part of what we're doing. And uh, the grassland, which I think traditionally often has been overlooked as a habitat, will we think be one of the kind of flagship elements of the project. So Nick, are you finding any of our Belted Galloways in training for their, their high tech have. future. Um, I definitely have, Sam. I don't know what we're doing training wise at the moment. We all look to be lying down. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we've eaten quite a lot of grass today. And a lot of lunch break. A calf kicking around. So, yeah, here's the here's our bioengineers in front of us a mixture of uh, blue greys and belted Galloways, uh, Sturks and heifers. And well, I guess if one's got a calf, she's not a heifer. Um, but these animals at the moment, we're just on the site um, to to get used to the site, I guess, much as anything else. And we do need to do some, some grazing around in a more traditional way whilst we get the rest of the technology up and running. But these will be the guys which are going to go around, the guys and girls which are going to go around, actually helping to trample up some of the bed, helping to create seed areas, being asked to, to graze in areas intensively or less intensively, depending on what the needs of that particular site are at the time. But in an open landscape with no fences, they will be trained to use the no-fence technology, which gives audible alarms to animals when they go, when they creep up towards what's called a geofence. It's a fence you can't see, it's created in GPS. And that audible alarm will soon learn to back away from that uh, and, and stay within defined areas. It's technology which has been used in many places um, uh, in Europe and, and some places in England. Indeed, there's a, a similar system being used in Epping Forest where the numbers of visitors they get there is in millions um, uh, per year, as opposed to the, the, the tens of thousands we get here. So it's also proven to be pretty safe with, uh, with people. And a really nice story about this is the farming family that's taking it over, the Davidsons, um, are a young family, um, young kids, etc. And this is their project. And they are, this is a business for them, uh, but they're, they're farming the cattle and they're getting this opportunity to enter farming in a different way uh, than the, is the traditional route. But many people who are involved in agriculture will know that the average age of farmers now is extremely high and, and the opportunity for youngsters to get involved is quite limited. The cattle have been chosen by the Davis to be particularly calm as well so that they, um, 
you know, we, we've got to be recognised that the public will be will be here. But NTS is also on this site. You'll be thinking about different ways of how to do things like managing dogs, etc. So because the cattle are on here, there is potential uh, uh, downsides to in interactions between cattle and dogs. There'll be good signage up in terms of uh, the, the policy on dogs, keeping dogs on leads, etc., which is actually really important for wider parts of projects like ground nesting birds and things like that, where your average Fido can't tell that it's a protected species and will just randomly eat eggs without many members of the public knowing this. But here's the cows. I'm afraid some of them will be beef. We won't tell them that now. The rest of them are, are all girls, some of whom are pregnant. Now we're going to go over next to an area of woodland generation, Sam. So if you want to maybe talk about the processes we're using for that uh, whilst I get in the car and go on the next bit of my journeys. Great. Thanks, Nick. So that woodland, so that's the one we've not spent too much time on uh, discussing. So we're just going to head over to an area of looking at this kind of um, wilding, wilder woods project. Nick, just as you're, as you're speaking, I'm going to show some drone footage of the, of the site as it was earlier this year. Uh, the project's obviously already started. So what we're looking at doing is experimenting with different types of woodland regeneration and studying it at quite, quite a high level of scientific detail, because we know there's lots of different factors coming in to a site like this. Um, you've got the uh, topography of the site, you've got that soil quality issue, its current use. So we were looking at expanding areas of woodland into former grazing areas. We're looking at taking away, and we have taken away, plantation commercial forestry, so the conifers you're seeing there, but also we're interested in introducing other species, which uh, we think can do well there. And uh, so it's a lot of kind of micro experiments in exclosure and enclosure and, and, um, and, and all the different ways we can look uh, at how the woodlands come together. And it's quite important for us to do this because we know that um, trees, that woodlands are hugely important for so many people who are interested in um, the fight for, 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 for nature. But of course, we've had that kind of slightly educational um, disconnect that some people see plantation forestry, commercial forestry, and they don't quite see some of the issues around that. They see all trees as being of kind of equal value and of being good. And we know that's not quite the case, really, um, that there's a huge different uh, value as a habitat of a, of a, of a plantation of Sitka spruce against a native woodland and also what we can expect from the regeneration of woodlands as well. We know that over a hundred year period we'll have phases of succession. Uh, we're expecting to see that and to monitor that and how we um, curate from a, from a human management point of view, making sure we get the right type of mix and what works um, best for the site. Community involvement to one of our great ambitions will be for um, as many people from the local community to be planting trees on into this um, area in the areas that we are planting. And we want to do lots of engagement on regeneration and what to expect from regeneration. We've had some amazing, lovely little stories of um, oak seedlings popping up right in the middle of Knock Robin, where Nick was earlier looking for the geese that had been you know, buried by a jay once upon a time and, and, and feeling confident to, to, to come and raise their heads above the, above the soil. And we want to be looking at how we work with the seed source on site and encourage uh, and manage that seed source as well as introducing new things. So it's gonna be quite um, a patchy woodland for a long time. Um, this is another kind of communication thing. We have to be very careful with a project like Free Landscape Restoration Project. It's terraforming to a certain extent. It's gonna look quite messy at some periods. Uh, we're hard landscaping. You know, We're doing lots of, of things that are not gonna be completely aesthetic. And that's why that vision, that long-term up to hundred year vision is so important because we're not trying to focus on the immediate uh, uh, benefits of, of what we're trying to do, but the long-term. And I think that um, the woodlands in particular will really help us do that. Uh, Nick, are you getting anywhere close to where you want to, to talk a little bit about oh, the mix of trees and... I'm quite happy to, if you want to stop sharing, I'm in a reasonable position to see a mixture of the good and the bad. So as soon as the screen comes up, you'll see in the distance there, uh, there's one of our uh, woods, which is actually very unnatural. It, it's got a mixture of some native trees around the outsides of it and uh, some mature conifers of mixed species, a mixture of larch, which if anyone can see clearly on the screen, is suffering from large diebacks, so would have to come out anyway. 
uh, Sitka spruce, and I think there's some Douglas in there as well. And then we've got patches of uh, probably planted, let's face it, hardwood um, um, areas, but no regeneration um, because it's, this whole landscape has been farmed for grass for many years. So really, one of the really exciting parts of this project actually is we're moving it from grass farming to all plantation or anything like that and allowing it to mix and mold how it wants to. We're on the eastern edge of the, of the project at the moment, which naturally lends itself to woodland generation. And I think I heard um, Sam saying about uh, acorns coming up. If you look through the Gallery Glen's uh, Facebook videos, there's millions of them. You'll have to look at hours of footage. You'll find a little montage I did with uh, Davy on an oak seedling. Um, these oak seedlings have been germinating year after year after year on this landscape. Of course, they get cut by a silage um, before they even get a chance to spread their arms. Now, the grass being as long and rank as this, again, they'll probably not survive. They'll be outcompeted by the, by the, by the um, grasses. However, when you add in a more natural grazing system, not grazing continually and continually, but grazing as if, as if wild animals would have in a wild landscape, you create the seed beds for things to start um, occurring. We're very keen as we create more of this woodland, that we don't go down the route of plastic tubes. Many of you will see plastic tree shelters be put up and it's a traditional way of planting hardwood in recent years. But it seems to me that no one ever goes back and recovers them. And they're meant to be recyclable and so biodegradable. But I know, I know trees that have been planted 30 years ago and they're now being strangled by plastic tubes because the person's got the grant and walked away. We're trying to think of different ways of doing it. There's a, there's a saying, uh, the thorn is the mother of the oak. Is that something we can experiment with? Can we, use, can we use things which grazers are not too keen on and allow them to shelter the, the other hardwoods as they come through? And it's gonna take a long time. This is a hundred year program. I'll probably not be around near its end. If I am, I'll be a feat of medical, a medical marvel, but it, it, we've got to think on that long-term objective. And the brilliant element about this is it's so experimental. So there's an opportunity to actually look at what's going on here and not be, not be scared if we've made mistakes, to actually be honest about those mistakes and put them up so they're not repeated by other people. Sam, over to you as I catch my breath. Thank you, thank you Nick. You've done wonderful reporting. Um, that's really appreciated. I think you can, uh, yeah, put, put your feet up. Um, I'm just going to just touch on something I think we skipped over um, when we lost um, my, uh, my signal. Uh, and that's just a little bit about how we connect the, this type of project to um, other aspects of the National Trust for Scotland, because we want to be bringing together the, the, kind of the principles behind um, you know, landscape regeneration and historic property restoration, which we've also done for, for many, many years. We've got a wonderful listed cat, uh, cat um, uh, bee listed farmhouse, the 18th century uh, estate center, uh, Kelton Mains farmhouse. Um, about 30,000 people look at it from the outside every year. And it's a key, key location on site if anyone uh, has, has been there. And it's a great opportunity for us to look at how these former agricultural buildings can help provide some of the, the orientation which uh, Nick so ably, ably given us on site. Really part of that interpretation, interpretative journey we want people to experience, to learn about some of the, the concepts, the ideas, what to expect. Um, some big maps of how the property uh, will, will how the how the place will develop into the future. So we're looking at also that visitor aspect, that learning aspect as well. And we've got really kind of key development for us is how, um, in fact, the, the the fight for nature can help have these spin-offs. That, that what we're looking at now is that um, there is appetite from from so many people to understand and experience these types of projects and sites. And it's a really great opportunity for us to bring more people into that wider mission of the organization, the wider mission of, of, of the sector and providing a visitor facility, which is just off the A75, one of the busiest trunk roads in Scotland. So we're really excited about how we can connect all these elements together. So the, so the built, the, the cultural and the natural heritage coming together at a single location uh, to inspire future generations. And we hope make a real contribution to, to the fight for Scotland's nature. That kind of wraps us 
up from our point of view, but I would like to bring in um, my colleague, Rebecca Miller, who is going to um, just talk a little bit more about our contribution to this great campaign. Yep, thanks, Sam. And hello, everybody. My name is Rebecca Miller, and I work in the policy team at the National Trust for Scotland. Um, so I'm sort of going to build upon what Sam was just talking about, but um, looking at how three relates to our wider campaigning activity to help nature recover. Um, because as well as delivering on the ground projects like the three landscape restoration project, um, a key way that we're working as an organisation to help nature recover is through the Fight for Scotland's Nature campaign. So as Sam and Nick have um, gone over, the way the land at Three has been managed in the past has stripped away some of the conditions that nature needs to survive and to thrive. And we can see this story replicated across the whole of Scotland, really. Um, over the last 50 years, over half of our species have decreased in number and currently around one in nine species is at risk of extinction. Um, I'm aware that those stats paint an extremely gloomy picture, but I think it's, it's important to emphasize here that although yes, our nature is suffering and it is at risk, um, when we create the right conditions for nature to recover, it can it can absolutely thrive. Um, it's got a really amazing capacity to recover when we lit it, like we're doing at Thrive. And I thought the the project at Thrive is fantastic, and it's going to be an exemplar of best practice. It is only one project and what we want to see as the National Trust for Scotland are, is projects like Thrive replicated across the whole of Scotland. But to achieve this nationwide change, what we really need to see is investment and leadership from the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government have already set uh, legally binding targets to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions and we're now asking them to also set targets for nature recovery. Setting targets is by far the best way to secure the funding, the political commitment and the monitoring that we really need um, to restore natural habitats and reverse the decline in biodiversity. So how do we get the Scottish Government to commit to actually setting these targets? Well, the National Trust for Scotland, along with um, various other environmental charities, have come together to form this coalition called Fight for Scotland's Nature. And our campaign ask is for the Scottish Government to set legally binding targets for nature recovery. But we can't achieve this campaign ask alone. Um, real political change only happens when people put pressure on their politicians to act. And that's um, kind of why I'm here with this segment today. I'm, I'm here to ask you to add your voice to our campaign um, to put pressure on the government to act in all of our interests and help create the conditions for nature recovery. So what we're asking people to do is to write a short online message um, to the environment minister explaining why nature matters to them and you can do this by going to the web link that's on your screen in grey so that's www.fightforscotlandsnature.scot forward slash action and as well as um, inputting your own message about why nature matters to you you'll be able to um, see what other people have written. And at the end of the summer, we are going to collate everybody's responses and present them to the Environment Minister. And this is going to help us show Scottish Government how much people in Scotland need nature and why they should invest in helping it recover and set these nature recovery targets. Um, the, the link that's in grey on your screen is also going to be in the YouTube chat so you can click click on it there directly. Um, so please help us help Scotland's nature recover today by posting a message and when you've posted a message please do share the link with your
family and friends because the more people that we can get uh, writing their messages, the more powerful we're going to be as a campaign. So thanks, Sam and Nick, for letting me input my um, campaigning spiel there. And I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to you now to speak a bit more about three. Thanks, thanks, Rebecca. That was uh, yeah, a really, really important message. I know that everyone down here at the project supports. So do we have a q and I think, I don't know, Rebecca or Nick, you're going to feed us some questions from the YouTube and I'll try and uh, field them best I can, ideally with uh, Nick Chisholm and uh, David Thompson's help as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm here as well. Um, as a side to this last week, those questions come in. Um, quick thing about Galloway Glens. Mm. Uh, we are incredibly proud to be part of this project. Um, it's one of 30 odd projects we're involved with Galloway Glens. We're only here for a short period of time. So our, our input in this is to, is to pump prime, if you like, make things like this happen. Uh, and I think the ideas of doing something like this um, on NTS ground at three have been around for many years. It's really a testament to the current management at three that this is actually off the ground. It's an incredibly hard project and a complicated project. Uh, to manage. So I think a big thank you from Galloway Glens to the, the way NTS has handled this whole thing um, from right from the start, where I think to be quite honest, at, at four years ago, we were kind of scrambling around trying to work out the best way of delivering it. And we formed an amazing team where we're, we're now at that point, we're about to really deliver something very exciting. I'm not sure that there's any questions in the chat. Um, yeah, Sam and Nick. Um, I guess one one question that it might be worth talking about uh, a little bit is how this got off the ground because it's it's a really impressive partnership. Um, the number of people involved in it and and the timescales involved in it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if I maybe start on this, I mean the. I've, I've been in the region working on environmental work since 1997 and three was always trying to work out how to do something and was looking at wetland areas and etc but trying to get those sort of like that, that mass of, of the funding that's required and, and the and the willingness of lots of people to get involved in doing it I mean a, a number of years ago action like this on biodiversity would have had a lot more resistance than it has now so the the, the, the landscape's changed in that sense that people now want to see this sort of difference. And in the late 90s, when I was first involved in this sector, if you start talking about things like climate change, a large chunk of the population was saying it was all fake. And obviously that has changed massively in the intervening We're now in a, with a team of people who want to get on and do it. The fortunate position we're in with Dumfries and Galloway Council getting the funding for the National Heritage Lottery which enables us to then work with our partners, uh, NTS, to actually deliver something on the ground. Much of this project will be, you can spend as much as you like on it in the future, but initially it needs to have that large capital spend to make to get the things in place. So Sam, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a project that's been um, kind of developed, you know, I, I, it had various incarnations. I mean, it started as a project looking at um, a very different era of, of the estate. And I think that through kind of discussion on site and having that, that kind of conversation on an almost daily basis with, uh, with Galloway Glen, Landscape Partnership team and within, within the trust as well, it kind of evolved into being a landscape restoration project. And you know, we were quite pleased that we were kind of adding in um, a lot of new elements and, and, and the whole process you know, despite all the issues of the pandemic, has has continued. It's maintained momentum. It's built momentum, um, and I think the vision has been even more relevant to to what we're trying trying to do. We started with quite a simple you know concept of of from my point of view managing kind of multiple kind of sites. How do we make the the property more interesting? Dynamic? What's its genius? What's its real purpose for us as an organisation? And um, this idea of transformation, of land transformation, of course, is a hugely important uh, and very exciting field of, of nature conservation. That's called, I think, the public imagination. And um, you know, we 
we, we were able to, to provide the, the resources ourselves. And obviously we're still looking for more partners to come and join us to make those continued capital investments that, that Nick mentioned uh, and then maintain it and add in those visitor uh, elements, which we think will, will provide real access and understanding from the general public, from our visitors, members and supporters. Um, but it's a small team of us managing it uh, on, a, on a day-to-day basis and um, three different organizations at the moment, all, all working together. And I think that these projects of this scale and ambition have that power to bring together uh, different organizations and, and absolute credit to Galway Glen's Landscape Partnership Scheme for all their support. And we were also very lucky with our ecological consultancy, Connix, a uh, fantastic company to work with um, and really support the delivery and, 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 and planning of, of this great project. Any other questions, Rebecca? No, I've, I've been, we don't have any other questions, which I think is is credit to how how good a job um, Sam and Nick did uh, explaining the the project. You've clearly covered all the questions that people would have had already. Um, so yeah, so, so so there's there's no more questions um, on on YouTube. So I think that we'll just leave it there. But thank you so much to both of you for talking about the project. It's it's really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to future talks to hear about how it, it progresses. As well, questions may well be asked on YouTube uh, later on, uh, as people see that watch this at different times of day, etc. So Sam and myself will drop into the YouTube video every now and again and I just check to see if there's any questions there and have a go answering them. I'll, I'll leave you to do that, Nick. You, you'll be more, you're more on YouTube than I am. So, um, <laughs> but it's been a great pleasure to be able to talk about our projects. Um, you know, it, it's a real drive for us at the moment. And I really hope that in due course, people will not just be able to, to, to watch us online, but really come to Thrive. Um, Castle Douglas Galloway is an amazing place to visit if you haven't been before. Great place to live too. And, uh, and and see us in action. And all the interpretation that we're looking at, the experience is going to be something for absolutely everyone. Uh, so I really hope that you will um, come and visit Thrive. I suspect hey, now it's time to stop the share. <laughs>